And, but there was a stranger in their midst, a visitor who had never been in the church before. So my friend, the pastor said, didn't you understand this is a meeting of the board? Yes, said the visitor. And after today's sermon, I suppose I'm just about as bored as anyone else who comes to this meeting. <laughs> And I have another one, but I'm going to skip it. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 35 and verse 4 says this, Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong. Do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Would you bow your heads? Dear Lord, we, we, this morning as we gather here, we gathered in your name, we prayed in your name, we lifted up people and needs in your name. It's all about you, it's all about your name, Lord. And as we look into these uh, morsels from your word, help us to be just honoring your name and what we say and what we do. Guide and direct these words into our hearts and uh, cause them to have an effect that you want them to have. In Jesus' name, amen. So most of the text today is Acts chapter 1. And uh, the disciples, mostly Jews, they knew um, the law and the prophets. They knew um, the books of Moses, the Pentateuch, that's called, the Torah, that's called in uh, Hebrew, and the prophets. And... Um, the book of Isaiah was part of the prophets. And uh, these people had a history of tyranny and domination. But Isaiah, uh, Isaiah that I read said, to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. And it's talking about God will come with vengeance, with divine retrib retribution. And these people had a history of tyranny and domination. From the time of Solomon, they never really had their sovereignty. They were dominated by the Assyrians, the, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks. And at this particular time, the day the times of Jesus, the Romans were dominated, were dominating them. Even the king Herod, he wasn't really, he, he wasn't even a Jew. He was a, a puppet king that was put up there by the Romans. Can you imagine how fed up the Jews were with this long history of tyranny? The Romans exacted a heavy price. They allowed certain things, but uh, you know they they took slaves and they and they took a heavy taxation, and um, they set up this puppet King Herod. And King Herod sold the priesthood. It wasn't the way it was supposed to be. He sold it. So those in power, the um, Herod, the Herodian dynasty the high priestly families and the Sadducees were not looking for a Messiah. They were not. Since that would upset the present order and the Romans who had placed them in power, that would upset them and things would happen. And that's the mindset um, of the chief priest's declaration to Pilate when he said, we have no king but Caesar, John 19 and 15. So Jesus had moved among the people of Galilee and Jerusalem for three, three and a half years of public ministry. The disciples and especially the apostles um, had been with him. They had seen him do miracles, impossible healings, lady that couldn't stand up, um, healing the blind, the lame could walk. It was uh, awesome. But they were with him and they could see him doing those things. And they saw Jesus call Lazarus out of the grave. Also, um, at Nain, he healed a guy that was on his way to the grave, the widow's son. They saw these things happen, and they had 
had been under his teaching. They were there when he confounded the Pharisees when they tried to prod him with questions with his simple but brilliant logic. They saw him arrested. Some were there at the, at the crucifixion. And they saw him after the crucifixion. Now, they came to him with this question in Acts chapter 1. In verse 6, then they gathered around him. So those who had scattered when he was arrested in Matthew 26, 56, those who had been terrified and fearful, now they're gathering around him with one concern, one big question they had. They asked him in verse 6, continuing in verse 6, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? That was what their concern was. People like to hang around with a hero. People like to flock around someone that has some kind of a heroic power. Someone who emerges from a grave is a hero. Especially, well, no one else could do that on their own power but Jesus himself. I mean, he, was, he died a horrible death. He just didn't pass out from a heart attack. They saw him. They knew he was tormented, tortured, and executed. Blood came out of his side. And he was dead, dead, dead. And he came out of the grave on his own power. That was a hero. So they like, people like to flock around someone uh, that heroic. So they knew that he was able to do what they were asking him to do. They were asked, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom? There was no doubt that he could do it. He would be able to call down fire from heaven and destroy his enemies and the enemies of that kingdom. These disciples, they wanted to see it. They wanted to see that. They wanted to see descendants of David in that lineage take over the country again. Maybe they wanted to be part of it. Surely, you know, his friends, uh, he, he would use them in high office. He had said something to them about being on a throne. Obviously, they didn't have understanding. They couldn't see beyond their own thoughts. Their thoughts were worldly. They were temporal. The Holy Spirit hadn't come yet. So their minds were clouded. After the Holy Spirit came, things changed. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 2, 12 to 16, What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. So they were not able to really understand what was going on what Jesus was going to do. They had their minds set on temporal things, on worldly things, and they asked him that question. So here's the transition. In verse 15 of, uh, of um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, there's a transition. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. 4, verse 16, Who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. They didn't have it yet. They didn't have it. 
and you know all they had I mean don't be too hard on them they were only operating on worldly understanding temporal understanding uh, and all they had really was their own mind and most of the world is still like that today but back to Acts chapter 1 and here's the answer Jesus gave them to their question verse 7 he said to them it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority in other words he said to them none of your business times and dates are not your concern it's not your business to know that so observe here that it was a temporal or a physical or worldly kingdom that these disciples were asking after in their own thinking remember the Holy Spirit hadn't come to guide their thinking the rain that they were looking for would eventually come but it hasn't come and it's none of our business when it will come the time or date of the coming kingdom is not to be the concern of the church it's none of our business it's God's business there is a business that's to be our concern namely the Great Commission Matthew 28 19 and 20 therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I am with you to the very end of the age after the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2 everything changed remember they only had their own human temporal way of looking at things before that evidenced by what the question was are you going to to restore the kingdom at this time now that was after he had been walking around with them for 40 days post resurrection but remember the quest for knowledge that God did not reveal they were looking for knowledge that was not revealed by God that same quest for knowledge that was not revealed the knowledge of good and evil was a downfall of Adam and Eve because they were questing knowledge that God had not revealed God reveals to believers what he wants them to know Amen. He reveals to us what he wants us to know. The rest of it is his business. We like to think it's our business, but it's his business. Before the Holy Spirit came, they did not fully understand what his purpose was for them. Go and make disciples of all nations. Well, okay. But they thought he was going to make a kingdom that they would make disciples of. They didn't understand because they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. Some ministries today are date pickers. So far they've all been wrong. I worked in the, in the 70s with a Jehovah's Witness. He was a studio manager. I worked with him. Good man. Good friend. But they were convinced in 1975 Armageddon was going to come. They canceled their life insurance and stuff like that. <laughs> it didn't happen. I don't know if they picked another date after that or not. I don't know. But some ministries today are sign seekers. But Jesus said no sign will be given. Matthew 12 39 he answered a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah which was in the belly of the fish for three days that was a sign uh, that Jesus would be in the grave for three days we look for these signs and try to pick dates and there's a you know we don't need to know more than God reveals to us 
in here. We don't need to know any more than that. There are general signs that we point to that we are close to the end of the age. General signs. Um, this generation will not pass away and it's talking about the rebirth of Israel that happened in 1946 or 47. That's one that people point to. But specific times and specific dates, you know, there's more earthquakes than there ever were before, uh, things like that. But we're not going to nail this down to a time and a date. What we are to know is what we're supposed to be doing until that day comes. And we're not going to know that. It's going to come like a thief in the night. We're not going to know it. We're not supposed to know it. <laughs> People get, they dwell on eschatology. We're supposed to be participating in the harvest. In verse 8 it says, but, this is part of his answer to that question. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Power. Power to understand God's wisdom. Power to receive God's directives in your life. Power to resist the wiles of the enemy. It takes, it takes power to do that. It takes Holy Ghost power in your life and in your, and in your person to resist the wiles of the enemy. Power to understand the deep things of Scripture. I can remember reading this without the Holy Spirit. It was just ink on, page, on pages. But the power of the Holy Spirit enables you to apprehend the deep truths in Scripture. Power. Power to overcome the natural reluctance to witness for God. And continuing in verse 8, And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Remember, this is his answer to that question. Are you going to set up the kingdom at this time? He changed the subject altogether, and this is part of his answer. You, he said, you will be. And that is all people who would be his disciples. The promises come with a directive. You will. I will. We will. I wonder if these disciples even knew what he was talking about. Be my witnesses. What's that? Do you think they even knew what he was talking about? I think they wanted to share his authority in, a, in an earthly kingdom. Witnesses? What's that? They wanted to know when that kingdom would come. They wanted to know if he was going to restore the kingdom. They said, at this time. Continuing after, continuing in verse 9. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. He answered that question pretty thoroughly. Don't worry about dates and times. Don't worry about That's not any of your business. That's, God, that's God's business. But you're to be witnessing. In other words, you're to be building the kingdom. So he's gone. Now what? Our risen Savior was with us and now he's gone. We're alone. But what did he say? They clung to his words. What else did they have but his words? He said, I'll be with you. I'll be with you. He said, you're going to witness for me, but I'll be with you. In the same chapter, Acts 14, if we back up to verse 4 and 5, it says, On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. What do you suppose impact 
They didn't know what he was talking about. They probably thought, well, we'll be singed when that happens. <laughs> Baptized with fire, and the Holy Spirit. So this was just before he left them. So what did they do? They obeyed. Verse 12 and 14. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem, just like he said, from a hill called Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. Verse 13. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So in obeying and going back, he said, don't leave Jerusalem. They went back and they all stayed in that place and they waited. In doing that, they made themselves available for God to do a work in them. Made themselves available. Constantly in prayer. They had no other, they stayed in that room. There was not, they didn't have anything else that they did. They were constantly in prayer. A big prayer meeting. In which they made themselves available to God. And there were 120 of them. All together, constantly in prayer. Now for 40 days, Jesus had hung around appearing to them one of those times he appeared to 500 of them he proved to all that he was alive and that he was who he said he was he had done what he came to do he fulfilled the messianic prophecies he lived a perfect sinless life he was this unspotted lamb he went to the cross where he paid the penalty for our sins. He did all that. And they're clamoring to know when he's going to set up this kingdom. But they didn't have the Holy Spirit to give them understanding and insight. When it came, everything changed. Everything changed. The reconciliation between us sinners and our holy God was accomplished through what Jesus did. God made him who, who had no sin to be sin for us. On the cross, Jesus said, it's finished. It is finished with a loud voice. His work was done. But the work was unfinished. His work was finished. He did. He accomplished what he came to do. But there's a work that's not finished. The spreading of the gospel was only beginning. It still isn't finished. With the help of the Holy Spirit, the church began on the day of Pentecost. The Spirit hadn't fallen, that it wouldn't have happened. Peter, emboldened you know, by the baptized in the, in, in the Holy Spirit, preached a sermon to the Jews in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit brought the conviction with the words that Peter spoke. We speak the words, we speak the gospel to somebody, the Holy Spirit brings conviction. You can't convince somebody of the gospel truth because it doesn't make sense. It's a miracle of God. It's a miracle. It doesn't make any sense. It's a miracle. And for somebody to accept it is a miracle. The Holy Spirit 
brings conviction. You share the word, the Holy Spirit brings conviction. It's a miracle every time. And it's a more powerful healing than, 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 than the, the blind receive their sight. It's more powerful than that because it's eternal. It lasts forever. And here's what happened. Peter was Peter shared the gospel with them in verse 24 of Acts 2. He said, But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. When people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? They were cut to the heart by Peter, by the words by the inaction of the Holy Spirit on those words, by the empowering of the Holy Spirit. But Peter was able to preach that because of his Holy Spirit boldness. This was a newfound boldness with Peter. He was a fisherman. He was a guy that ran away. He was a guy that denied he knew Jesus. And now he goes out among the Jews, many of whom were the enemies, and he, with the other 11, they were there with him. He preached this sermon. He wasn't a preacher. But, he, but the whole sermon is recorded. He's got scriptures. He's, and 3,000 people got saved on that day. And the church started, began on that day. On another day, 5,000 more. And then there were people getting saved daily. The disciples started out with a temporal, worldly question. A worldly point of view. That's all they knew. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. They did what Jesus said. They waited in Jerusalem. The Spirit came, changed their attitude from worldly, from temporal to spiritual. That dynamic continues today. We don't know the date and the time. But we know the end is near. We can sense that nearness. But we don't need to know a date and a time. Our concern is to spread the gospel with the time that we have left. People are dying without God. We carry the gospel. We have the solution. We have it. Peter's sermon began with this. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. What a difference in how he's speaking. Listen carefully to what I say. He was with those who wanted to know. He was with those. He was with. He was one of those who had that question. Are you going to at this time restore the kingdom? But now empowered by the by the promised spirit of God. There is no thought about the temporal. Only the spiritual. There is no thought in his mind about are you going to restore the kingdom or or. When, is it, when are you going to do that? His whole thought is to get these people saved. To get the gospel out there. What a difference. The Holy Spirit. A lot of times our thoughts are based on what we want God to do. Or what we think he should do. Or when we think he should do it. That's what their thought was. I want to know what God's going to do and when he's going to do it. like you to do this Lord and by the way I'd like you to do it this way and oh by the way I need you to do it by Friday now we know that God has a sense of humor and he must be laughing a lot at the way we present our needs <laughs> whole life has one purpose to glorify God pre 
present the need, make your petitions known, the rest is up to God. When he does it, how he does it is up to him. Some things he's promised that he will do. But he didn't say he was going to do it right at the moment we're asking it. He didn't say that. The times, time, he owns time. You know that? He started time. He owns it. It's all his. So we can't make demands based on time. I want you to do this now. Well, that might be in your heart, but that's a temporal thing. It's not a spiritual thing. My dad had a stroke, a bilateral stroke, completely smitten on both sides. I think he was around 50 years old. Had to retire from his funeral business. Never walked a, never walked a day in his life again after that. He recovered. He was in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. He recovered to where he could... It was hard to understand what he was saying. But before that time, he was a very proud person. He was very accomplished. He could write poetry. He could draw. People liked to visit with him. He had wisdom. But he was very proud of his own abilities and his own wisdom. And God took him down to that level to transfer that pride onto God. My brother, they went to the church in Titusville, and my dad had one, at that, he was a double amputee eventually, but he had one leg off at that time, and my brother brought a shoe along. My brother was convinced he was gonna have a restored leg, and I gotta have a shoe to put on his new foot. But God kept him in that condition to keep him humble. And right now he's dancing before the Lord. You don't take this stuff to heaven with you. But there's a reason that he didn't get healed. In, in his life on earth. Sometimes there's a reason. And God kept him humble. The reason, there's a reason we're not wealthy. <laughs> God keeps us humble. We've, we've been up against a financial crisis before. God always comes through at the last minute because we depend on him that way. <laughs> you know, if we had a, if we could, oh, I'll just take it out of savings. Well, that there's a difference if you can if you're dependent on your own resources and abilities or if you have to depend on God he, te he teaches us a lesson that way that he's sovereign and that question about when are you going to do this and Jesus said it's none of your business when he's going to do it it's none of your business <laughs> here's what your business is be witnesses and share the gospel they didn't know what that was a witness. What's a witness? Well, you go in the courtroom. But when the Holy Spirit came, Peter went out and preached a sermon never preached before. There's two sermons of his recorded in the Bible. 3,000 people. The Holy Spirit came. Because what? Because they obeyed. They went back to town, got in the room, prayed constantly, and obeyed. They humbled themselves before the awesome sovereign power of our holy God. Amen. Amen. And I just wonder if we need to spend some time together praying for people. Not for the church because that's what we want to see. For people who need God. You know what I mean? And we would like to see them here. But what's important is that we see them in heaven. That's what's important. So I, I just think maybe we just need to, to spend some time in prayer for the community, for people around here that need God. Amen. Amen. Would you
come down here and join me in that? Are you with me? Come on down.